next, I'm going to introduce our final speaker, uh, Charu Srivastava. And I apologize if I said that wrong. You got that right. Okay. Um, and Shava is from Intel. She's a, an architect from the um, client and computing group at Intel. Okay, great. So should I pull in my slides to share? Uh, you can do it or I can share it and you just tell me when to move mm -hmm. them, whatever's easiest. Let me just check if I can do that at my end so I can control the screen a little bit better. Okay, I think I got it. All right, let me know when you see my screen. I can see it. And do you see this in... Uh, yes. Do you see this in full screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to speak at uh, SenseMac. So today's topic, I would like to speak to you regarding building personal computing devices with sensing at Intel. Um, I'm Charu Srivastava. I'm an architect at Intel, and I'm part of the group that's, uh, that builds uh, PC platforms, and so we are called the Client and Computing Group, uh, and in short, it's called CCG. Okay, this topic um, and this talk, I'm going to break this into two parts. First, we will just look at a little bit of overview on the general PC architecture. And in the second part, I would like to go a little bit deeper into um, our next generation of PC platforms that uh, Intel is, you know, branding with Evo brand name. And the idea here is to build smart PC platforms and how sensors actually play a very important role into that. So let's um, just dive in right away. <clears throat> I want to also spend about a minute to uh, really explain the term personal computing devices. We refer to them as edge devices or PC devices. And today the definition has actually become a very broad spectrum of devices. It's, it's tablets, it's smartphones, it's laptops, gaming devices, and desktops. Um, the, the core of these uh, platforms uh, all have uh, you know, one requirement, they, they need a microprocessor, they need uh, display controllers, they need uh, graphics, imaging, and, um, you know, peripherals attached to them. But they all have different use cases around, you know, you'd, you'd build a tablet differently uh, for power, uh, you know, uh, constraints than you would build a gaming device where you, you would look for performance. So it's important to keep this in mind when, when we think about uh, personal computing devices at Intel. I'd also like to go over the pipeline on, you know, how a PC uh, from generation to generation actually uh, gets built here at Intel. So it all begins with the platform vision. You know, what, what is the next generation of users out there uh, looking and expecting from their platform? So that's a lot of visionaries at um, Intel who will go out to conferences or collaborate with universities and across the board to understand what, what the user really wants. Then it goes into something called the planning and technology selection, wherein you have uh, planners and strategists come in and say that this is the kind of technology that would map to this vision and this is what we want. Then they would step in architects like myself who have uh, specific domain knowledge and we pick up from there, we build our own POCs or we put in uh, technical readiness uh, of, of what is referred to as TR and we prioritize these uh, technologies to say, yes, this is how it's going to be done, or we put a simple a blueprint around it saying this is how it, it would be implemented. Then it goes into the design and implementation phase where engineering teams pick up and actually start implementing them. And there you actually have the first uh, board that's, that's put in place, like the PCB board that you may have seen. That's called the post-silicon phase where it's, uh, you know, put together and the plat all the uh, different IPs actually come together for the first time, they are tested and validated. Um, and any changes made are, are done in the post-silicon are you know, expensive, but we try to minimize them. Uh, thereafter, after a lot of validation and testing, they get into what is the platform ready or uh, PRQ stage. And, and that's when we uh, give out these platforms in, in the raw design to companies um, called the OEMs who will take these designs in, and then put in their form factors around it um, and, and bring it to Best Buy and users uh, like everybody who can, who can start using these platforms. So that's a general pipeline, design pipeline for a PC platform. I'd also like to take you back to um, 10 years ago when I joined Intel. 
you know, we were releasing the, the second generation of PCs back then. This was based on the 32 nanometer process design and uh, it was codenamed as Sandy Bridge. So what you see actually on, on the image here is, is a motherboard with a lot of components that are physically um, visible. You can see the video codec uh, pieces are sitting right here. There is a central processing unit um, that actually uh, is attached to what is referred to as a north bridge and a south bridge. And the north bridge is your um, graphics and memory controller hub. You know, these are the, uh, the high performance compute uh, components that, that sit in the north block. Um, and then you have the South Bridge, which is the peripheral controller hub. We short name that as a PCH, and that is uh, all the input outputs, the LAN, the USB sensors actually go in there. Um, so this is this. Is, if you look at this uh, board, you could actually literally see all the components that are literally teams out there building these um, these blocks, right? And I'm going to fast forward to you know today, which is. Um, in 2020, Intel has released its 11th generation of um, uh, PC chipsets. And to give you a general idea, it's um, pretty similar to what it was in terms of, you know, if you look at the architecture, except the North block is now combined with, you know, the CPU and, and uh, GPU memory. Um, all of that is clubbed as, as part of the North block itself. Uh, but the South Block uh, continues to be the peripheral uh, controller hub and you have all the uh, additional capabilities attached there. However, if you look at the image on the right hand side where I'm uh, hovering my mouse, all of this is now um, on a 10 nanometer uh, process design and it's tagged in 3D. So literally all the components are now that we, we could see on the Sandy Bridge are all clapped together in this 12 by 12 uh, millimeter die size, right? It's amazing the amount of innovation that goes in there. So it's not just each of these components, it's also a lot of thermal packaging, you know, process technology in, in the way uh, you manufacture these uh, uh, dyes, uh, power management, a lot of innovation goes into bringing it down to this size. So I wanted to share this with you so that you appreciate, uh, you know, uh, how much actually goes into building all of these uh, PC platforms and the chipsets. So Intel has always been focused on building like um, the fastest uh, PCs with you know a very high focus on making them thin, lightweight, and uh, power efficient. Uh, but more so than now, we're also looking to build the next generation of uh, smart personal devices. And, and what that would mean is effectively, um, we have something called the Intel Evo brand that's launched uh, this year. And it's, it's, it's sitting on three pillars, which is, you know, focus, um, platforms need to be always ready, and they need to be adaptive. To do all of that, now more than ever, we are uh, relying heavily on a lot of sensors that, that can um, help, not just the, uh, the way these uh, uh, platforms actually perform in terms of how fast they are, but also how adaptive they are to their environment, because that makes for a great uh, user experience. To give you an example, if you are able to walk in front of your PC and you're able to unlock it, right, um, that, that would be a, a great example of how your sensors can come into play versus, you know, you're going out to your system and then clicking it to come on. Um, I also want to go over some of the sensors that are today already sitting on, on the PC devices. I mean, they've always been around, but now more than ever, they're, you know, they're coming up with innovative algorithms on how these could be used to uh, build a better and more robust system and a more adaptive and self-aware uh, PC platform. So Vision, I believe everybody is well aware of. Vision has always been around. We have IR cameras and, um, you know, IR sensors and, and cameras, vision cameras that, that are uh, enabled on systems. You, you also know that they are done on smartphones. Uh, there are audio sensors, there are uh, speech sensors, there are ambient lighting sensors, meaning how much light is actually uh, available in the room and the backlight adjusts um, based on that. Uh, the touch sensors we're all aware of, temperature, if you leave, left your PC out in the sun uh, on a sunny day, you know, the, the system needs to shut down at a certain point if the thermal temperature goes beyond a certain uh, threshold, there's orientation moving around your uh, PC into landscape mode and you know, uh, things like that. There's depth sensing for, 
for some uh, PC platforms to know how far um, or, or to get you know, augmented games wherein you, you kind of need to know the depth on the Z axis of, of the camera. But there also are challenges when, when we put all these sensors uh, uh, onto the PC platform. Um, it's the form factors. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, there are a, a, a plethora of form factors going out uh, in the market and each of these sensing capabilities need to be adapted uh, around uh, the platform we are building for. Uh, there are also challenges in terms of, you know, the same use case, like I mentioned earlier, unlocking a, a phone uh, where you pull it out from your pocket and place your uh, phone in front of your face and unlocking it is a completely different scenario than having a laptop actually sitting on a table and you walk in front of it. Um, so these are the different kind of, you, you'd rather have the same use cases, but there are very different ways of implementing them uh, with the sensing uh, designs. Then there are also constraints around, um, now we have detachable platforms. So there, there, are, uh, there are vision sensors that need to be placed on the lid of, of your uh, screen. And when you have detachable platforms or the ones that actually bend around um, or completely uh, twist and turn, um, you know, how do you design the physics or, or the physical aspect of putting these sensors on the lid? Uh, um, so, so those are some of the design constraints. Uh, then there's also challenges with what is the uh, power budget on the platforms, meaning we could have platforms that are designed for educational purposes um, a student um, in, in kindergarten needs a Chromebook to, to study, you know, just simple stuff versus, uh, let's say, a teenager who has a gaming platform. There are different uh, power budgets allocated for these systems. And so when we put in sensors, we have to be extremely uh, aware of uh, every watt or actually what is a lot, every milliwatt of power that is getting consum consumed. Um, when we apply these sensors. And across the board, all of these sensors are um, mostly always on, that in, they are uh, constantly looking for uh, feedback and information in whatever environment you're in. And so they need to be op operating at an ultra, ultra low power state. And th these, these become really uh, big challenges from um, an architecture perspective. Here is a very simple and a generic example that I want to showcase. Um, and I want to show you how today client devices are, um, can be used um, with sensors and microcontrollers to actually um, do the training on the client devices themselves and uh, you know, deploy those training models um, and learn and adapt over time um, to give you the most accurate uh, models and, and learn from the environment that that they have so we could take in a uh, you know pre-trained model train it for a couple of times and then deploy it on a ultra low power system which is on you know let's say a vision sensor um, and a microcontroller um, and run the inference on on uh, uh, on these controllers and there could be feedback mechanisms which will allow us to retrain and uh, optimize the results of the inference based on you know what the sensor is recording set this back onto the client devices themselves. And um, you know, over time, you have actually a, a much better trained uh, model because you were able to do pretty much the training and inference on, on the same client system. So these are some of the challenges that, that we uh, get. And these are some of the, the innovative ideas that we, uh, we come across uh, and you know, adapt and learn as, as we go to build um, systems that can um, be more adaptive and uh, perform at an ultra low power. And I hope with this talk, I have uh, given you an insight into what it, it means to build uh, uh, smarter devices at Intel. And uh, sensors can help us actually uh, be the differentiation on PC platforms uh, in this agenda. Um, that's pretty much all I had for this talk. Let me know if you have any questions. That was excellent and very interesting, Charu. Uh, are there any questions? I have not seen any from the Q and A. Um, yes, there's a comment in the chat that it's just an awesome overview. And is there a way we can architect that sensors are not always on? Um, 
Well, we can. So um, sensors can always, uh, you know, be on demand as, as needed, or they can be always on. Uh, but the, that all depends on the use case that we are bringing forth. So for example, I would like to uh, not have an intruder come in and see my screen uh, when I'm in a video conferencing situation would be very different from I'm walking away from my screen and walking in front of my screen every single time. In the, in the, the former case, when I'm actually putting on my um, video camera and doing a video conferencing, I uh, would have that on demand. But whereas if I want to dim my battery, um, my backlight as I'm not using the system and save on you know, um, display power, I have to have a, a sensor that's always looking out if I'm engaged with the system or not. If I'm not in front of the system, it should you know, within a certain time actually dim the, back, uh, dim the um, light. And so that particular use case would require an always on versus um, a system wherein I'm sort of calling on demand would not. And, and it, it all depends on, like I said, the vision of the PC, where we want to take it, how uh, smart and intelligent we want to make it, how uh, receptive to the user we want to make it. And, and these are some of the things that are really coming into focus um, in, in the next generation of PC users. Okay. There is a follow-up to that uh, question. Uh, yes. It seems that we are packing everything we can onto the motherboard, um, such as sensors. Why not specialize given contexts? Economies of scale don't add up, perhaps? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't follow through. So you're saying we are, we are uh, combining everything and uh, minim minimizing and making everything small and under the same die. So sensors need to be sort of... Uh, uh, so why why are we putting everything onto the motherboard rather than specializing in um, in separate contexts is how I read that question. Okay. So well, we can always go ahead and look at very dedicated platforms that are meant for certain things, and then you know we, we could uh, uh, defragment them that's or, or decompose them from from the um, uh, motherboard. But generally, when we're looking at building newer designs, I think companies, OEMs are looking for more thinner and, uh, uh, you know, more lightweight uh, designs. And, and that's one of the, it's, it's also to do with the routing and uh, the latency issues. So the more um, lighter and thinner you make them, the more compressed and smaller you make them. I think that's better in, in general for the new form factors that are coming along. Okay. I also added uh, uh, Katina, who's been asking these questions. I, uh, I let her unmute if she'd like to ask anything verbally. Sure, sure. Or not, okay. okay. Katina is in Australia, so I don't know if they're... Uh... Um, let me try, okay, she's asking me to unmute again. Katrina, let me find... Um, Ah, there we go. Uh, Cherry, it's Katina Michael from um, the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, and also the. Okay, uh, we had you there for a moment. Yeah, hey, I, I lost. Uh... I think I have you. Um, thank you very much. Sorry, I've chewed up some time there, Kristen and Andreas. But uh, Cherry, what a wonderful presentation! Yesterday we had uh, Jason. Uh, Boris from Intel come into our classroom and talk to us about OpenVINO. The students will be using uh, the cameras and use cases for people uh, and object identification. And some of the social science students in that technical class were asking why so many sensors by default. And I just thought that was a great question uh, to ask Jason from Intel uh, while he was with us as we are going to be building some of these proof of concepts over the session. But it's, I, I understand the OEM position. It's like, give me everything just in case I need it or just in case the customer asks for it. But I'm also wondering about the implications of doing that, both from the architectural, the low energy consumption, and also as the social scientists always ask me, but what about, you know, A, B or C? But, you know, I understood your replies. I think it was a brilliant overview. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. No, but, but you, you're right. We. Uh... What I meant to say is that not every platform will have everything. It depends a lot on 
uh, what what form factor we are aiming towards. So we have multiple SKU lines across, and each of them are based on power budgets. So there's a different set of uh, designs that we put in for low power platforms versus midsection versus high performance. And based on them, we also have use cases that are defined across the board for, for each of these queues. And like I showed in the beginning, the pipeline actually defines how, how things would work. So at, at, the, at the front end of that pipeline is, is a very important task of um, streamlining what use cases are required from what kind of form factor. So you're right, it's not everything is uh, going in every platform. But even in cases where we, we do need, um, uh, you know, vision uh, for low power or the, the use cases demanded, the challenges are around, you know, building those uh, for different form factors. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, 